Hello, I'm Mokar Rizvi, and this is Scope. Germany has ended a military mission in Cameroon. Now, this comes as a surprise to many, probably part of the German public, who didn't even know that Germany was involved, in fact, in Cameroon. Germany is also involved in Niger and Tunisia, where it says it is involved in military training missions. Now, all of that is apparently allowed by German laws as long as German military is not involved in conflict zones or in conflict situations where it is directly involved uh, on either side. Now, this is interesting because obviously this reflects what many other countries around the world are doing too, specifically Western countries, when they say they're providing military training, but right in the middle of conflicts. We know that in Cameroon, in the southwest, there is a conflict raging at this point, and even opposition politicians are now wondering why. Why exactly is this military mission, or did this military mission last until now, right as that conflict was still waging for the past two years? Let's discuss this a bit further. We're joined now by Christian Counter, who is a professor of policing and security. He's also director of the International Center for Policing and Security at the University of South Wales. He's joining us now from Cardiff. Christian, thanks for joining us here in Scope. What do you make of the secrecy of all of this? So why isn't the public brought in um, or at least notified that Germany is involved overseas in just military training? If it's as simple as that, uh, what's the big deal of letting them know? Oh, hi. Good afternoon. Um, the military missions in Germany have a particular sensitivity. So for any kind of combat mission that Germany is involved, the German parliament, the Bundestag, has to give explicit authorization in order to make that happen. Now, obviously, the way the international security setting is going, Germany is an increasingly important player and its responsibilities become clearer and clearer to most security analysts. Nonetheless, the German public, in a sense, hasn't really caught up with Germany's military responsibilities at that point. German public is very much opposed to military missions of any kind. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the Second World War and, of course, Germany's role within that and the kind of post-Second World War narrative of mm -hmm. Germany as a peace-loving nation that is not involved in military conflict. So as a result of that, for the German government, it isn't really very easy to mm. be very clear with the German public because the German public on the whole is not in favor of military missions. In but, then, but then Germany, Germany is a democracy, isn't it, Christian? So then in a democracy, public opinion rules. So why then would the government override what the public wants? Well, exactly. And, and, and of course, that is one of the big criticisms that is very often made, made that, of course, in a democracy, you need to be transparent about all the missions that you are actually pursuing. But in a sense, Germany is caught a little bit there because the government has different types of pressure. There's one pressure that is clearly from the, from the general public that is opposed to those kind of missions. But then there's another pressure, and you see it very much with the Trump administration and U.S. Uh, foreign policy towards Germany. There's very much the stick that comes out and, and the finger pointing at Germany. Why aren't you pulling your weight? Mm. Why aren't you doing more? So the German, German government is trying to reconcile those, um, in a sense, uh, forces that are opposed to one another, and is trying to make a semi-coherent policy out of that, which isn't always particularly easy and isn't always mm. very successful in doing so. Do you think um, overall, Christian, that the involvement even just in military and police training missions in Africa and places like Cameroon, is that a good thing? Uh, considering as the opposition politician of the left party, Stefan Liebich, he had said that uh, why didn't this mission end, for example, two years ago, and he was talking specifically about the Cameroon mission, considering for the past two years there has been conflict in the southwest? Mm. I think in general some of those missions have a clear purpose. And of course, one shouldn't forget that a number of those missions also come uh, in the framework of EU foreign policy missions. So in that sense, Germany also has an obligation to its other EU member states, a member states that are often complaining that Germany doesn't pull its weight, in particular France. Uh, that is a complaint that is very often made by the French government, that Germany is not pulling its weight. So in that sense, Germany does need to pull its way to a certain extent. But uh, it is very true to say that, of course, once a, 
particular situation spills into an actual conflict zone by German law. Uh, the German Bundestag has to authorize those missions. And if it doesn't, then in a way there is a breach of the German constitution. It, it is a mandatory requirement under the German constitution. Okay, so then, you know, uh, specifically when it comes to Germany's even history, when it comes to African countries, and I was reading up, and I didn't actually know this, but I've uh, discovered that Cameroon uh, was at one point in time um, a colony of Germany, uh, in some senses, of course. Um, and I, I've forgotten the years between which it was a colony, but that's an interesting context to all of this as well, right? Where there's this background to a lot of how these states' borders were, were drawn up. In, in countries like Cameroon, for example, we have two groups which continually fight, specifically in the Southwest, the Anglophones and the Francophones. Do you think such context is also important, not just, of course, for German involvement in Africa, but other countries' involvement in essentially countries that used to be their colonies. Mm -hmm. I think that context is, is absolutely, absolutely very, very important. Um, the way it works in a German context is because of its post-Second World War history and the kind of narrative that has been constructed in German foreign policy, Germany is very, very sensitive towards any kind of accusation of a kind of a post-colonial kind of role that Germany plays there. So German policymakers and the German public will be very, very sensitive towards that kind of uh, accusation. I think for European powers as a whole, this is obviously also, I mean, if we look at Africa, of course, a number of those countries used to be ruled at one point or another by a European power, whether that is the United Kingdom, whether that is France or Belgium, or in fact Germany. Germany, in fact, coming as a little bit of a latecomer, not ruling for very long, but of course, as part of a European power uh, concert, if you like, in, in, in Africa at the time. Um, now, there is a downside and there is a positive, and the positive is that it is primarily because of some of those links that European powers are sometimes still interested when there is a humanitarian crisis in some of those countries. What we also find is that when in a number of these countries there is a real humanitarian crisis, many, many countries are not particularly interested in intervening, and it's primarily via their former colonial powers that actually a kind of European response is constructed. So it has upsides and it has downsides. In Germany, certainly, there's, there's a very strong sensitivity, but uh, especially with the French and the Belgian kind of link, there's a clear sense that um, there's more of an interest in, in helping in those kind of cases when it is a former colony than when it isn't. Okay, so in, in general terms on Christian, you know, when any country's uh, government chooses to, to keep certain things away from the public eye vis-a-vis uh, -vis military training missions, even, or just police training missions, uh, do you think that that's ever a healthy thing? Because I would imagine that's a slippery slope, isn't it? Where then, uh, if, you, if you've given the government that much leeway in that specific regard, even if it's not directly involved in conflict, then what's to say tomorrow such a government wouldn't then go the next step? Yeah. I mean, it, it could be a slippery slope, and it could be argued that it can be a slippery slope, but one has to be careful because, of course, the German constitution is very, very strict on those matters. So if it ever became a conflict situation. Any party, in fact, any private citizen, could take the entire mission to the German Constitutional Court who would intervene, uh, and, and, and it has intervened in the past, in those matters very, very quickly. So the German government uh, needs to pay very, very strong attention as to what the legal mandate is exactly, what mandate the German parliament has provided mm. for it. So in that sense, in the German context, it isn't something that can easily happen because the parliament is a very, very strong influence on German foreign policy, just as the German constitutional court would also be. Um, it is a little bit more complicated in, if we look in the European context, mm. of course, the, in the British context, the British government has a lot more leeway and yeah. the kind of missions that it can conduct. It isn't as constrained by a written constitution as the German mm -hmm. uh, government might be. So there you could make that argument a little bit more mm -hmm. clearly because the British government is much less constrained than the German government. Equally, if we look at the French situation, the French president has much more authority in terms of 
authorizing those kind of missions than the German government would have. So I think it can be, and I think that fear is always there, um, but Germany has a lot of checks and balances to make sure that this doesn't happen and and, and parties have on occasions taken those things to the German Constitutional Court. Very well, Christian. We'll leave it there. That is our final word. Of course, we appreciate your time and insight today. That was Christian Counter speaking to us from Cardiff in the UK on the line. Uh, Important topic, of course, and it's one that should be highlighted because there's so much contextualizing that needs to be done of the situation. Uh, Germany wasn't in Cameroon just for military training, was it? I mean, that's at least a suspicion. Uh, why was it there for a whole two years while conflict was raging in the Southwest? It was there for a total of four years. Um, would it even have ended this military mission or would the public have even found out about this military mission had one of the opposition um, you know, uh, politicians not actually brought this up publicly? Um, and yes, as Christian said, the German constitution is quite strict in these matters. The German public does not like military missions of this sort. It's a democracy. They should be deciding. Why would the government override them? Why would the government try to keep this away from their eyes? Again, as I put to Christian, that is a slippery slope. And then the other context, which is really important here, I feel also is, again, the fact that Cameroon was territory that had been dominated by Germany from 1884 to 1916. And at that time, it was also called Cameroon, in fact. Um, so again, there's a lot of background to this issue as well. And this goes for many other such European colonial powers in the past and even till the modern day and their interventions in their former colonies. We'll keep a close eye on how all that develops with European interventions continuing in Africa here in Scope. I'll be back though with our next segment after this break. Thank you for staying with us, viewers. In this segment, we're going to discuss Venezuela. The Foreign Affairs Minister of Venezuela has denounced um, this, the announcement by the EU that it would place sanctions if these current round of talks that Norway is essentially hosting and is mediating between the opposition and the government of Venezuela, if those don't actually come up with some concrete measures. Of course, those talks, the most recent ones, took place in Barbados, as we know. Um, The Venezuelan foreign minister is denouncing that, saying that this is essentially an attempt to actually stall those talks, to actually hurt those talks in some way by creating obstacles and to destabilize them altogether. Uh, does he have a point? Why would the EU want to announce these sanctions at this point in time when there is this little bit of positivity and hope that something may come out of these talks between the opposition and the government? Let's discuss this further. We're joined now by Gabriel Calvijo, who is an analyst. He's a teacher in political sciences and a researcher in human rights, Latin American studies. Uh, he's joining us now from Columbia. We're also joined by John Monfort Dunn, who is Emeritus Professor of Political Theory, University of Cambridge, and Fellow of King's College. He's joining us now from Cambridge. And we're also joined by Ivan Farias Pelcaster, who is a political expert. He's also a PhD in political science and international studies from the University of Birmingham. Ivan, Gabriel, and John, thank you all for joining us. Uh, John, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Uh, the optics certainly aren't good, are they, John, for the EU and Federica Mogherini to be going after the Venezuelan government right in the middle of a negotiation process? Well, I, th- well, I think it's rather more complicated than that. I mean, the fact is that the um, European uh, weight in, in this process isn't very great, but it is definitely true that the government, the present government of Venezuela has had a a, a terrible effect on its country and it's shown very little um, flexibility so far in the face of massive demand for it to change. It's actually caused millions and millions of its um, citizens to flee the country. The electricity system is collapsing. There's widespread um, near starvation. And Venezuela is naturally an incredibly rich country, so it's an astonishing level of harm for a government to have inflicted. And the fact is there is as yet no evidence that the Maduro government is actually showing any real flexibility in these talks. And I think that, that uh, the European Union response is a, an insistence that some a real shift is required, some concession to the level of popular anger uh, and um, okay. some cessation okay. of the level of suffering. 
All right, so Gabriel, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Uh, is this a good time for the EU to be announcing that it will place sanctions? Well, well uh, I think it's a position uh, healthy in the way in the, that uh, the government of Maduro uh, didn't hurt the international community uh, in the demands of the support the people in Venezuela that it's that have a humanitarian crisis there and then the the paper of the role of the uh, European Union I think it's very health for the process uh, to be in a in a part of, of the resolution of this problem I think that uh, it's time that uh, Venezuela take a serious position uh, to fix the the chaos uh, in that country because it's very hard for the region for us as Colombian uh, to take the consequences mm. of this uh, the the humanitarian crisis is very 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 hard here in Colombia we have a, a, a yeah. around one or one million half of refugees uh, all time they are crossing the, the frontier and the Colombian uh, government uh, have the the all the good intentions to help them but it's very 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 hard because they are a lot of people and okay. the Colombian government can support all of that people with health with uh, studies with vaccines on all of that things that they need. Okay, so, so Ivan, I'm, I'm wondering where your thoughts are on that. Because I'm just thinking, and, and you can disagree with me if, if you want, Ivan, that right in the middle of a negotiation process for the EU to be announcing sanctions would actually harden the government's position, would it not? Uh, um, I think it's difficult to uh, kind of predict the, the outcome of these um, proposed negotiations. Uh, Right now, the international contact group, I mean, uh, is discussing and engaging with the Maduro regime. Uh, the expectation is that this will bring us to, uh, bring, will bring the Venezuelans to a uh, new election. However, uh, this is uh, only if the Venezuelan government agrees to hold them. Uh, the difference, for example, with the uh, Montevideo uh, mechanism uh, is that the multi-video mechanism did not set any goals, specific goals for the negotiations. Uh, this could have been set by the FARC, by the Guaido um, uh, supporters, as well as the Maduro regime. Right now, there's a lot of pressure for holding new elections. If this happens, uh, I think it will be possible to hold them. However, this will be only be possible if the government accepts these terms of the uh, yeah. international contact group. If it doesn't, I think they will reach actually an impasse again. Hmm. Okay, so, so John, I'm wondering, with this level of involvement on the part of, of Europe, and, and you, you said that you, know, um, you were wondering if there is much influence that Europe can really wield in this specific regard. I wonder then if Europe should be reaching out to the likes of Russia and others, and we know that the Russian Deputy Foreign Minister will be visiting, in fact, Caracas, Venezuela, um, this weekend, in fact, and he will be meeting the Foreign Minister as well. Do you think it's, it's smarter to try to reach out to those who are allied to the Maduro government to try to convince them or to try to talk to them uh, into then speaking to Maduro about, uh, you know, possibly compromising with the opposition? Well, I certainly, certainly think it would be intelligent for um, the European Union to, to talk very carefully to the Russians, I mean, and, and actually not just the Russians, also to the Chinese. I mean, this is a major international crisis, and it's a, it, it's a global shame what has happened to the people of Venezuela, really. So in a sense, I mean, it would be, it would be very good if the Chinese and the Russian governments were to, and, and actually now you come to mention it, the Cuban government, were to say to Maduro that his position is no longer sustainable. Uh, and that his government has lost its legitimacy. So it must actually either show that it can recapture the legitimacy in a plausible way, which I don't think is going to happen, or, or it, it must actually um, submit to a, a real popular choice. It's not, it's not defensible, its present position.
But I agree completely with you that actually it would be diplomatically intelligent to try and see how much uh, Russia and China could help because they can't actually appreciate what is going on in Venezuela at all. But I, I wonder then, John, could you argue that it may very well have been the likes of Russia, China, Cuba that convinced the Maduro government to come to these talks to begin with? I don't know what, what caused to convince them. I think they were under enough pressure from one angle or another that it probably wouldn't take any particular person. But the, the problem is not whether they are prepared to be seen to be holding talks. The problem is whether they are prepared to concede in the talks enough to make, give any possibility of the situation improving. Mm. Okay, so Gabriel, I, I'm wondering from, from your point, and of course you, you contextualize the situation with Colombia having to host many of these Venezuelans who are coming across the border. Uh, do you not think at some level, though, Gabriel, that, that Venezuela's government, Maduro, may very well be maybe trying to you know, act in this fashion because it does not want intervention um, just on the side of the likes of Guaido and would like some independent voices, such as possibly Norway, to be leading the process, as it has been? I, I think that it's uh, possible. I think that Venezuela is looking for uh, intervention, um, neutral intervention, maybe Norway or another countries that don't have the power of the signification as USA or as the uh, European Union, uh, because the regime of Maduro see them uh, like enemies of, of his regime. He's more, uh, Maduro is more uh, proclaimed to to watch and to look for the help of Rus Russia, of China, that they are uh, of I Iran, of Turkey, that because they have um, a, vis a similar vision of their uh, practices, political practices. And uh, right now, I think that Venezuela is looking for a neutral position, maybe Norway or maybe mm. another type type of countries that uh, put a relaxed position and give them uh, a, a, a field of, of freedom in mm. their, their actions. I okay. think that the, mm. the international press is very hard with Maduro. I think that he's getting uh, tired of that pressure. Indeed, because uh, Ivan, I, that's a good point that they're brought up because it does seem, Ivan, that whenever talk of Venezuela comes up, it does seem quite one-sided. And yes, we can probably criticize the Maduro government legitimately on many, many points. But I wonder, um, is that any way to move forward, though, with any neutral process of negotiations where both sides will have to compromise? I mean, it can't just be that uh, if the United States supports Guaido and many other countries do as well, that that is something that the Venezuelan people just have to accept? Yes, uh, I think it will be possible definitely to, uh, to reach uh, a decision uh, and a consensus on this matter. Uh, as long as uh, Guaido will also allow, for example, other uh, opponents and dissidents of the regime uh, to also take part of this um, agreement, uh, it would be possible to reach a, a consensus with the government. For example, if Enrique Caprile, the Paul Lopez were to come forward uh, against the opposition, uh, maybe there would be other options. Uh, mm. Also, um, the government at the moment is trying to call for new elections in order to gain power. If the elections were to take place in November 2020 as it's, uh, as it's scheduled, and the uh, elect, uh, people at the National Election Council were to be chosen and appointed fairly, I think it would be possible definitely to, to reach a consensus and an agreement on this matter. Hmm. John, you know, one of the things that, that Gabriel brought up, which I think is really important, is, is that of the right of, of how to govern your respective country. Uh, and, you know, as, as a longtime academic yourself, I'm sure you can appreciate that there are always two sides to every story when it comes to any country's respective affairs. So who's to say that it should only be the way that the U.S. wants Venezuela to be governed? Why can't it be the way, for example, if the people were to want for the way that Maduro governs, for example, or socialism or whatever we want to call it, be the form of government that they respect. 
Well, it's, well, it's certainly my view that if the, the people of Venezuela did wish to be governed by Maduro, they should be governed by Maduro. It's not anyone else's business to tell them, and it's certainly not the business of the United States. And I don't uh, know enough ex about the, the basis of Guaido's support uh, in Venezuela to be confident that actually a uh, government led by him would be an overall improvement on the Maduro government. It would obviously have very different political and distributive sympathies. But um, I think what is crucial is that no government which actually causes the, not the proportion of the population to flee the country on the, to the degree that uh, the Maduro government has done can possibly be a legitimate government. And if, the, if the Russia or China had seen population exit on that scale, it wouldn't occur to any Chinese or Russian politician to claim that the government was still legitimate. This is a catastrophic. John, and John I'm going I'm to interrupt you just because we're running out of time, but I just, I just wanted to continue this for 30 seconds because, you know, it, it can be argued then, listen, it was actually the sanctions that were placed on Venezuela Venezuela, as the Venezuelan government would term it economic warfare, that, that actually caused all of the above. What do you make of that? I think it's, com it's complete rubbish. I mean, you can follow this as a process. I mean, Venezuela is a real place to me. I've been there. And it was an incredibly rich and, and uh, in many ways, a, a, a incredibly beautiful country. And it's been absolutely ruined by the Maduro government. Mm. You can argue that Chavez was a very historical phenomenon, and he stood for lots of things in Latin America, which uh, attracted okay. admiration outside Venezuela. No one outside Venezuela admires Maduro, and not many people inside it really admire him. Mm. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it there. That is our final word, but appreciate all of our guests for their time, insight, and, of course, analysis. That was John speaking to us from Cambridge, Gabriel speaking to us from Colombia, and Ivan was speaking to us from Warsaw in Poland. Now, um, we, of course, spoke about at length about what the situation in Venezuela is like right now with these negotiations happening. Obviously, we don't know um, the structure of these negotiations and what, if anything, is really being achieved. But the fact that there are several rounds that have already taken place is probably a good sign, uh, certainly, and Norway remaining hopeful, saying that any public statements need to be very careful and need to be very calculated on the part of all parties. Uh, yet Federica Mogherini of the EU, as well as the EU uh, Parliament, announcing that they would place sanctions on Venezuelan officials vis-a-vis -vis travel and other restrictions if these round of negotiations don't actually provide any concrete results. Is it the EU's place to be doing so? Uh, is it the U.S. place to be placing sanctions on Venezuela at this time, worsening the economic situation there, as, of course, uh, the Venezuelan government itself would argue? Or is it the way that Guaido should want it? And should he actually be leading the country, as the argument is on the part of many people in the international community? Um, there are two sides to this, of course. And it's important, as Gabrielle said, that it seems that the international media, for a very large part, seems to be one-sided in this regard. As we know, with any international story, there are two sides to the story. So it's very important to look and understand at both sides before making a judgment. We'll keep a close eye on that situation in Venezuela here in Scope. I'll be back though with my next segment after this break. Welcome back, viewers. We're still here in Scope with me, Wakar Rizvi. Now, as the Brexit saga continues, um, MPs there in Parliament have now put back bid to stop the new prime minister, who will likely be Boris Johnson, according to most estimates, from suspending parliament, which is called prorogation, to force through a no-deal Brexit. Now, Johnson could very well essentially block parliament out of having a say on a Brexit deal if he feels that they would reject it. Now, would this be a bad thing um, at a time when Brexit has been continuing for such a long time, and it seems that MPs are simply not being able to agree upon it to begin with? Or would it be wrong for a new prime minister to try to just force it through um, at this time? Or is a no deal just a scenario that should very well just happen, um, as Johnson as well has not ruled out, mind you, saying that a no deal Brexit is better than uh, a Brexit that, uh, that gives too many concessions, I should say, to the EU? Um, a lot of possibilities, of course, but should Parliament have a say is seemingly the main question at this time. There's even some rebel lawmakers who even said that they would refer to the Queen, who possibly could get involved in this entire situation, though, of course, it's not been seen for a very long time for any monarch 
or royal family member to be involved in such a direct fashion um, in the affairs of the country in that regard. Let's discuss this all a bit further to contextualize it. We're now joined by Mark Brolin, who is a political analyst and economist and author of A State of Independence, Why the EU is the Problem, Not the Solution. We're also joined by Andrew Glencross, who is a senior lecturer at Aston University and senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. We're also joined by Alex DeRoyter, who is director of the Center for Brexit Studies at Birmingham City University. Alex, Andrew, and Mark, thank you all for joining us. Um, Andrew, I'd like to start with you, if I may. What do you make of MPs again, trying to make it ever so harder for Johnson to, to put through a no-deal Brexit. Um, should it even be this way? Because again, I, as I put in my introduction, we've been talking about Brexit for so long and going back and forth and back and forth that one wonders, is a no-deal Brexit really that bad? Well, MP, MPs are saying it's very bad and therefore there's a majority of MPs who don't want this to happen. And it's the only thing there's a majority in this parliament for. Therefore, I think we need to respect the voice of the House of Commons and understand that if they think it's not a good idea, then really the country itself shouldn't be forced into this by some scheme of the new prime minister. Hmm. But then Alex, you know, this, as, as, as Andrew there said, this is the only thing seemingly that MPs agree upon when it comes to Brexit. What about the deal itself? Well, I mean, if we look at the deal itself, yes, it was rejected three times by Parliament. But in essence, if the Brexiteers had voted for Theresa May's withdrawal agreement, we would be out of the EU by now, if your uh, preference is to leave the EU. Hmm. Um, that said, you know, it could very clearly be said that the only Brexit on offer from the EU is one the Brexiteers don't want. And I, I think we have to bear in mind, first of all, these are statements by Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt designed to secure the Prime Minister position. And then second, whoever gets that ball will still be faced with the same reality that the only withdrawal agreement on offer is the one that was negotiated by Theresa May. Mm. OK, so, Mark, I wonder, do, do you agree with that? Do you think that Boris will think that once he's in office, if he does come into office, that he's really stuck in the same situation May was in? It will be stuck in the same situation in many, in many ways. But what has really changed is, is the pressure from the, the Brexit party, of course. So in one sense, we're back three years ago on square one, when we had a party of discontent, with, which is sort of pressuring the Conservative Party to move towards, if you would say, right. So he, he, will, he will be forced to push for a no deal. Otherwise, uh, they will be mangled in, in, in a general election, which is likely to come. And when it comes to proroguing Parliament, I think that's just a negotiation gambit, which, also, which, which tells us that he is uh, negotiating in a, a quite different way than, than Team May was negotiating. And I don't think he would ever do that, because it would be strange if you push for Brexit to get democracy back. It would then be very strange to prorogue uh, Parliament. But I think all this will lead to a, a stalemate again. But the difference is that he, he will have to push for a, a Brexit, proper Brexit, and that will probably lead to a general election, in, in my view. OK. So then, Andrew, do you think that, that, that it's, it's really realistic that this point, at this point in time, with the 31st October deadline, again, coming ever so much closer, as have other deadlines come and gone, do you think that the MPs and the rest of the country, and even the prime minister, be it Boris Johnson or whoever, can actually come to some sort of a deal? I, I suspect not, but at the same time, the default is for the UK to leave unless there's another kind of negotiation with the EU to delay it even further. But the EU will only delay if there's a good reason to delay, not just a new prime minister, but something like a new election. Hmm. And do you think a new election would even be considered by the likes of Boris Johnson? He will look at the numbers and, and I don't think if there's a question of extending the a delay from actually staying in the EU, he will actually have good numbers to go to the people and win a general election on. Therefore, that's why he wants to keep pror prorogation up his sleeve. So we're really in a number of catch-22 positions. Indeed. And so, Alex, you know, you've been studying this Brexit situation for, for a while now and researching on this, but I wonder... Um, at this point, what, do you, what is your feeling about the 31st October deadline? Will that be extended again? Because, you know, this saga continues unendingly then, doesn't it? 
Yes, well, it's not in the interest of either party, clearly, for the UK to exit without a withdrawal agreement. And, and, and I still think it is distinctly possible, indeed, we in several murmurings out of Brussels suggesting that the EU might yet be prepared to offer the UK another extension. Uh, of course, you know, the, the, there is still that uh, long-standing fact that they would like to see some significant shift. But this is a catch-22, as Andrew's pointed out, and I don't see any way out of this for Johnson other than to, if he becomes Prime Minister, of course, other than to, to request another extension to push for maybe something like another referendum. I don't think there would be any incentive for them to push for another general election, as the, the, the polls look dire for the Conservatives, and, and the only scenario that they could well form a government under would probably be in coalition with the Brexit party, uh, which would be deeply problematic for a lot of Conservative MPs. I just don't see that working. So I don't think an election would solve anything in this regard. I think the only game changer that would give Boris Johnson or Jeremy Hunt a way out of this mess, if you like, would be to put the vote back to the people. Hmm. And why not put the vote back to the Denmark? I, th I think if you're a Brexiteer, it's strange to, to have another vote before you have delivered, realised the Brexit. So I, I'm actually betting my money on, on a general election instead. And I think he's actually preparing for it now. I think any scenario we spell out, he, he will go to Brussels and ask for a new negotiation, a uh, new deal, but he's not going to get one, which is uh, acceptable to his, his team. Um, and after that, I don't think there will be a referendum. I think there will be a general election. Hmm. He, th at that point, he will be able to say, I tried and I failed. Now we need to have a new an arithmetic in, in Parliament. And, and uh, I think he's winning back voters from the Brexit party by being a bit of a hardliner at the moment. And the Labour Party have major problems for not only Brexit reasons. So I think in a way uh, it's looking a bit more up for the Conservative Party, even though I agree uh, with the previous point that, that they do. Of course, they have problems. All of, all of the parties have problems. But I think it's looking a bit more up for the Conservative Party now than for the others. OK, so, so Andrew, let's for a moment, I want three of your thoughts, in fact, on what a no-deal Brexit would actually mean. Because, again, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, there's been a lot of scaremongering over what a no-deal Brexit would actually mean. Do you think it's been overstated? Do you think that it wouldn't be actually as bad as, as many people think it may be? If you're asking me, are we prepared in the UK for a no-deal, I think the answer is clearly no, because, for instance, the government still needs to pass a, trade, a piece of trade legislation that needs to get through the Commons, get through the House of Lords, in order to have the competencies, in order to be equipped to do things under WTO rules, for instance. So there's a lot of technical preparation that still isn't in place. Therefore, we would be fighting on many fronts to catch up with the problems caused by a no deal. Hmm. Alex, you know, on that point of trade, in fact, uh, I'm which politician it was in the UK, but um, he or she had said that, listen, if we have to renegotiate trade deals, is that really a bad thing? Well, that's, that's a bit pie in the sky statement. Trade deals typically take years to negotiate. The EU-Canada agreement took a good eight years, and that was just for a country pursuing a limited free trade arrangement essentially around manufacturing. It's a very different story for a country that was a full member of the EU as a trade bloc to then leave and then still somehow hope to keep all these lines of access uninterrupted. I think if you look at the government's own official forecast, to, you know, with the Office for Budget Responsibility, a very respectable body and somewhat modest in their conclusions, they think the cost of a no deal to Britain would increase borrowing by 30 billion per annum, would lead to a 2% shrinkage in GDP and lift unemployment. Now, in addition to having an impact on house prices in the UK, negative impact, these are real estimate costs and, and, and somewhat conservative in their conclusions. What would the EU do? Well, very much the ball is in their court. I mean, the UK can control things that it exports out in terms of its own check-in requirements. But of course, what it has no control over, as Philip Hammond pointed out, is um, sorry, uh, control over imports. Well, what it has no control over in that sense, in terms of customs and checking regimes, is exports to the EU. Mm. So, you know, the UK would be relying upon French authorities, for example, with the Port of Calais adopting a light touch regulatory regime. We don't know that that would be the case. Mm. Yeah. OK, so, so Mark, what are your thoughts on the trade and, you know, the other issue which is spoken a lot about when it comes to a no deal possibility is that of, of course, a hard border with Ireland? 
Yeah, they might take it a bit, a bit different. I think it actually has, has been uh, exaggerated, the, the, the problems. Uh, of course, there is no perfect scenario. We would all want to have a trade deal before uh, the UK leaves, but it's not going to happen. And what we're, what we're having now is a problematic situation as well. So I think uh, a no deal will be many mini deals, and that will be OK. And we will also re reach a, a creative destruction situation. And I think uh, starting from scratch after a no deal, then, then it will uh, step up the action to, to such a degree that a deal will be reached much more quickly than if we continue this path, we, which we have been on now for three years with nothing happening. So in, in the, when we have many sort of baddish situations, I think a New Deal is the best. Uh, if you're realistic, I think it's the best situation at this point. And I think regarding the Northern uh, Ireland border, I think that will also sort itself out much more smoothly than uh, people are saying. Mm. Uh, I think it has been politicized uh, dramatically. Andrew, what are your thoughts about the hard border with Ireland? Because obviously Ireland itself is quite concerned about any possibility of no deal. But Ireland is still a problem in a no deal situation, because if you talk about these mini deals, you need the consent in a no deal scenario to get little things about um, airlines, about other sorts of trade issues going forward. If you want to get an agreement with the EU there, every member state of the EU will need to accept that. Ergo, the Irish government will have to accept it and the Irish government will therefore have leverage to say, we want to have a different type of border than just a hard border. So we would go back to the border problem in that scenario. Mm. But then on that border issue, Alex, you know, there has been, and I remember watching a Euronews report not too long ago about how the EU may very well decide that, listen, is it really worth it to be standing by Ireland to such an extent? Do you think that there are some in the EU who may be questioning that? I don't know, but I think what the EU displayed to date has been consensus, and that typically is the way that decisions are made. And going forward, you know, in terms of any new trade negotiations to try and pursue a new trade agreement, that would require the agreement of all the EU member states, including Ireland. So that, let's not assume here that the interests of Ireland can be so easily pushed aside. Mm. OK, so, Mark, I'm just going to give you the final word, because, you know, one of the things that comes out with, and I know I've asked you this before, too, but I wonder if your thoughts have changed now, is that of why this entire process has been so painful from the beginning till today and seemingly going forward. You know, for the rest of us on the outside of the UK, it's sort of baffling that there is such chaos, confusion, and just uh, things are still not settled, even though there have been so many rounds of negotiations, a deal has been reached, but yet seemingly not agreed upon by the UK Parliament, etc. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's, a, that's a good uh, analysis. I, I think we should see this as a transition period, which is playing out. And it's, these kind of things usually take uh, years to, to settle. And if we take, the, for example, the, the democratic breakthrough in 1919, it took around 10 years with, with factions and there, were, there was a political stalemate. And I think there is a parallel situation today. Uh, but with, what we are seeing is that the Brexit faction is, is actually moving forward. The Remainers are saying, they said from, from the day after the referendum, that many people had changed their minds. This isn't actually true. I think it goes the other way around, uh, that more people are, are now fed up, uh, a bit more fed up with the EU than they were three years ago. And I think the tide is turning towards the Brexit side. We can see that definitely in the Conservative Party. Uh, and that's why I think these things take a long time. There is still a stalemate in, in Parliament, as we see, but I think next time it will be a little bit more Brexit. It will still be a problem. Uh, but the next time after that, it will definitely be Brexit. I think we are moving towards the proper Brexit. I, I, I think there is no doubt about that. This, this is sort of the, the mm. transition period when it's confusing. But after, 10 years from now, I think we'll all be confused that there was even confusion at this point. OK. All right. That, that's an interesting point, an interesting uh, conclusion to end off with. But um, we'll, of course, try to have all you gentlemen on to continue this discussion because, of course, we've only really touched the tip of the iceberg on some of these issues. That was Mark, Andrew and Alex who were speaking to us there respectively about this topic and sharing their insight with us. Uh, we appreciate, of course, their time. Now, of course, as I would put to the guests, um, there does just seem to be, it, you know, eternal chaos when it comes to the Brexit process. Uh, is this just natural? Um, is this just growing pains or pains of just divorce, really, from the EU, which uh, should have been expected? And probably were not, the public were probably not informed of all of these details of how painful this entire process would be and how lengthy it would be. Uh, will we finally achieve Brexit this year? 
Uh, that's a question which remains in my mind, and I'm sure many Britons' minds as well. We'll keep a close eye on all of those developments coming out of the UK and the EU here in Scope. I'll leave it there for now, though. I've been Rokhar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.